You're listening to a podcast from 702 and Cape Talk. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. It's 27 minutes to 10, and it's about that time where we connect with Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist, for all your weird and wonderful science questions. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Great to be chatting to you. Um, And we start off with the story that uh, you were intrigued by. It has to do with radiation exposure for spacefarers. What is the latest thinking? What have we uncovered? Well, if you've been following the headlines in recent months and years, you'll know that we haven't got our sights set just on a return to the moon. Space scientists would quite like to go interplanetary, and there's pretty big ideas afoot to try and get humans onto Mars. And President Mm. Bush in America during his presidency said by 2030 he would like to see a base on Mars. Now the problem is that you've got to get there. And as soon as you leave the protective blanket of the Earth's magnetic field, which extends into space a considerable distance and protects us from what's called cosmic radiation. It means that a a person or anything travelling through space is going to be experiencing really quite high levels of cosmic radiation. These are very high energy, heavy particles that are capable of doing quite a lot of damage to our tissues. Mm. But what health effects might they have? Well, there's a paper which has been published this week. It's by researchers in California, Charles Limoli and his colleagues at the University of California, Irvine. It's in the journal Science Advances. And they have not sent people into space and irradiated them, but they have tested or brought space to Earth by irradiating with uh, particles mimicking the levels that you would experience them in space, mice. Mm. And what they did was to test the brains and the behaviour of these mice after just a six-week exposure to a fairly normal amount of space radiation. And what they find in their mice is that there are really clear memory and other deficits in the behaviours of these mice. And when they go looking in their brains to find out why, you can see that the nerve cells in certain parts of the brain make far fewer connections Mm. and the what are called dendrites, these are the spreading arms that project away from nerve cells and receive connections from other nerve cells. It's almost like someone's come along with a pair of shears and pruned Mm. the tree. They're very, very dramatically reduced in number and density. And so they're saying... What's almost certain is that a person travelling to Mars, which would take us about nine months in space, the amount of radiation that they're going to see is, means that almost every single one of the nerve cells in their brain is going to get hit several times by these radioactive particles. And if what they see in their mice is true of astronauts, there could be some really quite considerable brain effects, just, yes. just behavioural effects and memory effects as a consequence. And so NASA or whoever decides to send people on these long journeys in space is going to have to think very carefully about this and come up with better, better ways of shielding our equipment and people when they're on long space journeys because mm. there could be really quite considerable health impacts. Mm, well, that's what it gives us, you know, even more reason to find ways of protecting uh, uh, those that will be travelling into space. Wow, those are remarkable results. Let's hear from uh, Claire in Fishhook. As you know, the phone lines are open on 011-883-0702 and 21 and if you uh, would like to chat to Chris, you have a niggling, weird, interesting, or perhaps even relevant science question that you'd like to pose. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Um, Chris, I was just wondering, and maybe I'm talking nonsense because I'm no geological scientist, but I was just wondering, we've heard over the years about the crust of the Earth pushing north and under the Indian Ocean, pushing up the Himalayas, do you think there's any connection between this and the quake they had in Nepal? Hello, Claire. There's every connection. You're absolutely right. Uh, about a um, hundred million years ago, India was connected to Antarctica. And uh, it was down there in one giant supercontinent. There was bits of Australia connected up to the same thing. And there were penguins and things that were the sizes of a well, a human being wandering around in this very tropical environment down there because the world climate was quite different. And over time, India and the, and the Indian plate has migrated north across the Indian Ocean, rammed into where it now is and pushed up the Himalayas. Those movements are still happening and the the fault where the two plates meet is storing energy all the time and over over time it's a bit like you blowing up a balloon and blowing up a balloon and it stretches and stretches and gets a bit more tense, it's got more energy stored. Eventually it suddenly pops and something goes, all that stored energy from years of, of accumulated attempts to move suddenly go and you unleash all the energy in one go and get lots of vibrations and that's exactly what has happened in Nepal it's happened in this region before we know it's a very geologically active area and uh, the Himalayas are there as a sign that these two plates are colliding with each other
Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. Pleasure. Right, that is Claire in Fishhook. And John, you're calling from Strand, um, and you're talking about AM radio. Hi there. Um, I'm, just, I'm just intrigued as to why when I, I listen to AM radio, and when I drive under power lines or that sort of thing, um, it, there's instantly static when I listen to AM. If I'm under the same power line and I change over to an FM station, it's absolutely clear. I'm just wondering... What's happening? You know, why, why is there that difference? Hi, John. Well, there are two really very different ways of doing radio. The AM is the earliest means of doing radio, and the way it works is that uh, you're basically applying the signal to the size of the waves. So you send your radio signal, your carrier wave, you take the voice signal and you superimpose it on the wave, making the waves taller or shorter, and it's that amplitude that's being modulated, and that's how the radio decodes and makes the sounds that come out of your radio. FM stands for frequency modulation, and actually what you're doing is you're sending around a central frequency, you're sending slight variations in the frequency of the waves, and the information you're transmitting is in those variations of the frequency. And the radio decoder set is extracting the information from how the frequency wobbles rather than the size of the waves wobbling. When you drive under a power line, there are a number of things going on. Big power lines are producing huge amounts of magnetic fields and magnetic influences on the environment. They may also be producing small arcs and sparks and leaking energy into the environment. They're also a big metal conductor, so they're soaking up a lot of electromagnetic ra radiation from the environment. So as a result, when you go near them, the amount of signal or the amplitude of the waves that are coming to you is going to vary very dramatically, and there's going to be lots of noise, electro electrostatic noise being produced by the power lines themselves, and this is going to confuse your radio and destroy your listening experience, which is exactly what you're saying is happening. Got it? Thank yeah. you. That's John calling from Strand. Well, Chris, I have a question that um, I came across in this um, New Scientist magazine. It's very interesting about all manner of questions uh, that have been compiled in that New Scientist uh, magazine. And one of them has to do with uh, uh, an egg. Uh, so there was an, someone that cracked an egg um, and they found that it had a whole new egg inside. It wasn't a double egg yoked egg. Uh, it was a double-egged egg, <laughs> if you get my... Now, why doesn't that happen at Easter? That would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it looks like there was a completely new egg. It, it was inside with uh, a shell and a yolk inside another. So how would that happen? Well, I, I don't know that specific story, but I can speculate. And one possibility is that the way in which eggs form is that way up inside the chicken, you have an ovary where the eggs are effectively born. Mm -hmm. What that is doing is producing the yolk, which is a big ball of fat and energy, which is going to and uh, it's surrounded by the albumin, the white proteiny stuff, which is going to nourish a developing chick. And there's an embryo in there. And it's possible that the process that makes these things happen inside the chicken got a bit confused mm -hmm. and you ended up forming one and it didn't move out of the way in time and then you formed another one and so I suspect that that's how one egg got inside another egg and that as they then move down the uh, ovipositor, the oviduct, which yes. brings the eggs to the outside world, that's where the shell is formed. So once you've got an egg inside an egg, then you can wrap one egg up inside the other. So I suspect that's what happened, but I'd, I'd need to read the story to be sure. Okay. Uh, we also have Mark calling from Santon. Good morning, Mark. Morning, guys. Um, I was wondering, with all the problems we have with electricity now, people are buying expensive standalone generators, but why can't we use our cars, park it in the driveway, let it idle for a couple of hours, and just let that generate electricity? Surely it's the same principle. I'm going to listen on the radio. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Hi, Mark. The bottom line is that you could do that, and when people buy a generator effectively what they're doing is just hitching an engine up to a big alternator. Your car engine is a pretty powerful energy unit and it's connected to an alternator. The, the point is though that cars are for going along the road, they're not really for generating power and uh, it, uh, you'd need to have a very big alternator in your car to produce the kind of output that you need in order to power a house because just a one bar electric fire is one kilowatt and your car is running at 12 volts which means you'd, you'd have to have an output from the alternator of about 10 amps to run a one bar electric fire and it's just not practical to conduct electricity and that much energy at such low voltage so you'd need to step it up with some kind of step up transformer 
uh, or an inverter, and that's going to lead to energy losses. So then you've got all these noisy cars running, lots of local pollution, lots of uh, energy losses because they're small units generating small amounts of power on a small scale. No economies of scale there, so that's a bad idea. Much better, actually, is to have a central power station which does all those losses once and then distributes the energy at high voltage and then you minimise the losses, hopefully. I thought you might actually be mentioning about something which is becoming much more uh, en vogue to think about. And one idea that uh, scientists and technologists are exploring actively now is the idea that rather than regarding energy as something that comes from a power station and goes to your home, we have a super grid system where everyone becomes a producer one way or another. And in very sunny countries like South Africa, what many people could do is to have a big array of solar panels on their roofs, for example, you could also have wind turbines in places that's windy. You could have hydrothermal sources where, where it's appropriate to do so. And everyone generates electricity on a more micro scale and stores it locally. And the idea is that you have a big battery. Now, where would you put that battery? Well, rather than just dig a hole under your house and have a giant battery to store things just in your house, why not use your car? Because... In the future, we can have electric cars. If we have electric cars, which oh. need to have a large a body of electricity stored in them, um, actually, you're not going to use all of the juice in your car all at once or all the time. So what you could do is leave your car plugged in in the garage. Your car is soaking up the energy you're producing from the roof of your house, from your garden, or it's soaking up surplus energy when there is some from the national grid, storing it in this battery in the car that's very good at charging and discharging quickly and storing large amounts of energy. Mm -hmm. When you need to go somewhere, you just unplug the car and go somewhere because it's one car, it's not going to make much difference. Mm -hmm. But when the national grid suddenly finds itself under load, rather than brown out half the city and have outages, what you do is you temporarily steal some of the power back off of everyone's cars that are plugged in in their garage, soak up that energy into the grid, keeping everyone's air conditioners and fridges running just for a few seconds while the grid catches up, and then you give the power back later or at night time. When, uh, you, when there isn't any solar generation, you can net borrow power off people and they give it back during the day when there's a surplus in their solar cells. And this is the, the smart grid of the future and it's probably what's coming. Yes, and uh, since we have such serious power problems, perhaps we should be leading the way and trying out the new thinking. It's good well, to... it's true. I mean, it's very, very sunny countries mm. actually could do a huge amount because solar panel technology is becoming really rather good these days and you can produce with a modest array a rather good supply of electricity. And so places like Australia, South mm. Africa are really well placed to exploit this technology. Well, thanks to Mark for that one. We've got Janet in Randburg. Hi, Janet. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Chris. Chris, what is going wrong in your body when you suddenly are allergic to something, but you don't, actually don't know what it is? And you've been absolutely mm -hmm. fine for plus minus 60 years. Yes, well, when you have an, an allergy, I'll speak generically, when you have an allergy, your body is reacting, or at least your immune system is reacting against something in the environment that it regards as hostile to you, but which actually is really inno innocuous or harmless. In other words, food, for example, is, is a good example of this. We regard food as innocuous. Food doesn't harm us. It shouldn't actually cause any difficulties for us. But some people, some substances in some foods, some people's immune system regards food as dangerous and it mounts a response to it. Now, we know what's going on in terms of the nuts and bolts of causing an allergic response. What you have when you have an allergy is too much of an antibody called IgE, and this IgE antibody recognises some component of the thing you're allergic to, binds onto it, and it detonates these cells in your skin, also in other parts of your body called your mucous membranes, mast cells. And mast cells are effectively like landmines full of histamine. And they're actually there as your early warning system. And the reason you have them is that when some infection or a parasite or something tries to get through your skin or irritates your skin, it normally detonates these mast cell landmines. The histamine comes out and the histamine acts a bit like a, a burglar alarm. It calls in the local policemen who are the immune cells to come in and inspect the problem and see what's going on and, and fix it. But in people who have an allergy, of course, you're detonating these landmines all over the place all the time and it causes this massive release of histamine and this has unpleasant consequences. It causes itchy eyes, itchy skin, weepy eyes, blocked nose, sneezing, coughing, asthma in some, some people who have that. And as a result, it's very unpleasant. 
we would like to know why some people make those classes of antibodies that attach themselves to the mast cells and then start to re regard things that they shouldn't regard as harmful as harmful at the moment we just don't know and so the treatments are all symptomatic they mm. stop the symptoms they block up the immune response but they don't actually stop those antibodies getting produced in the first place as we get older you can have a, a breakdown in the regulation of your immune system it becomes less good at, at uh, discriminating friends and foes and that might be part of the reason why you can get allergies as you get older as well as when you're young Thanks for okay. that, Janet. It is a very curious case because you've, you've been running your life a certain way, consuming, eating what you've been eating, and then suddenly one day you just can't anymore. Um, yeah, and mine is mainly, it's with clothing. Oh, so yeah. certain I'm materials you're allergic to. Yes, I'm, I'm fine with anything that's can't, cotton. Can't, she, she can wear Versace, but she anything can't wear Chanel. Wool, polyester. <laughs> I see. No, Chris is saying you can wear Versace, but you can't wear uh, Amani. Chanel. <laughs> Chanel, for instance. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, thank but you, thank Janet. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thanks for the call. Thank uh, you. Jenny, Bye. goodbye. Let's go to Jenny and Stellenbosch. Hi, Jenny. Good morning, good morning. I would like to know why my cat does not catch my cold. Um, I've had this cold for nine days. My cat sleeps closely with me, he's not sneezing or coughing, and I don't have to blow his nose. Why is that? Well, that's a good thing, though. <laughs> Chris, yes? Yes. Uh, the reason the, the cat can't catch it is because it gave it to you in the first place, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we wrote an article on the Naked Scientist website a little while ago. It's called, Can My Dog Give Me Diarrhea? Uh, because this is a common question. People are worried, can I share my bugs with my pets and vice versa? But in fact, there's not really any evidence that happens. And the reason is that whilst, yes, dogs, cats, humans, we're all mammals, we're sufficiently different to each other in terms of our physiology, our biochemistry, and the way our cells look and work, that a virus is so tightly optimised to get into and exploit and hijack a human cell that it just doesn't find itself compatible with a dog's or cat's cells and it can't operate. And a good way of thinking about this is if I buy some software for my computer and my computer is running Windows, I can't take the CD and shove it in a Macintosh and expect the same software to run because the operating system in the two computers and therefore the instructions that the computers are expecting in order to read the disk and run the software are quite different. And viruses are very, very similar. Viruses are effectively a packet of software. They're just a tiny bag of infectious DNA or RNA, the related chemical, uh, which intends to hijack a cell and turn it into a virus factory. Mm. If the operating system in the cell is different, then the virus instructions are not going to work properly, and so the cell is not going to make any new viruses, so it can't make you sick. And that's why, on the whole, most animals are resistant to each other's infections because the viruses that spread among those animals are so highly optimised to work in the cells of that species. That said, when yeah. you do get a jump of one species to another, you do tend to get very, very dramatically unwell because the virus normally goes into a case of sort of overkill and it makes people very, very sick because it can drive the immune system very, very hard. There is a possible exception with some of these, inf these infections and I did say, can my dog give me diarrhoea? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a study going on and, and somebody I know in Cambridge is actually going and comparing uh, samples of what goes down the toilet from humans with what their dog leaves on the pavement because they have a suspicion that uh, and you can in fact detect noroviruses, one of the poo bugs, in, in dogs and their owners. And you can find the same strains of norovirus in dogs and owners. We're not sure if they're transmitting between the two or if one just happens to be picking up what the other one's leaving behind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're actually looking at this now and asking the question genetically uh, to find the answer to that one. But right now, I think you're pretty safe from anything your cat can give you. Yes, uh, but also, how do we dis how does how is that different to bird flu, for instance, because that jumped? Yes, and that's why I'm saying that occasionally when you do get a jump from the animal world into the human world, or vice versa, it tends to cause very dramatic illness. Ebola is a really yes. a good example of yes. this as well, because you've got an, an, a virus which is very highly and tightly optimised to its host. In the case of Ebola, it's a bat. In the case of flu, it's a bird. Mm -hmm. And the virus has evolved to control the immune system in those animals very, very well, but those animals have evolved to control that virus very, very well. When you do take the virus out 
and shove it into the new host species, those control measures in both directions don't work properly. And as a result, the, if the virus can grow, it can actually grow out of control and produce very profound illness, yeah. which is what we see with bird flu when you get a pandemic. It makes people really sick. And when you get Ebola jumping out of the bat and into the human, it's non-natural host. Because it can grow a bit in a human, it drives the immune system wild and you get a really, really severe illness. Mm. Well, Chris, it's been great chatting to you. Fascinating as always. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Have a great weekend and see you next time. More fun next week. Absolutely. That was Chris Smith, our Naked Scientist. And if you want to find out more about the Naked Scientist, you can visit their website. It is the Naked Scientists, plural, dot com. Um, and that's where you can read up more of the columns that he was referring to and the research that they've been doing.